Alright, making a draft science video. Kind of sloppy, but hopefully the point will be made. Um, so anyway, hopefully you'll be able to see that little dot and the piece of paper and such. And um, so what I have here is just two diffraction gratings and they have 500 lines. And unfortunately this height is a little imperfect. But anyway, hopefully you can see the two outer edges, fringes, on the outside here, these out here, over there, and uh, so these just two pieces of film, and I'm just sliding them across each other so they're coming in different angles. You know, I can slide them up and down and nothing will change. Um, if I slide them perfectly straight up and down, you'll get very little change. And, uh, but if I do a little bit of an angle, then you can see them turn. Um, so the point is, they're clearly, it's two, um, separate patterns. And the dots are sl slightly smaller in the one set, so it's a little bit weaker. So clearly the light going through the center of the laser is being, um, it's being diffracted a second time just the center light primarily um, so just pointing that out now if I turn them <coughs> this way you probably aren't going to see it so now the two lines are crossed and it's basically the same effect except now the two patterns are like a square you can't see the bottom dot you might not be able to see the top dot <laughs> so whatever you can see some of it or you can't see any some of it um, but yeah uh, so the point being that these two layers are stuck right next to each other and clearly the two aren't combining they're creating two separate patterns distinctly separate one moves with one sheet, one moves with the other sheet. Um, not the same at all. I mean, not combined at all, anyway. So I just wanted to show you that. Um, <clears throat> lots of other bigger and better things to show, but that's it for now. Oh, I gotta undo that laser. Because... <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna untape the laser. Spare the batteries and save the laser also I imagine so anyway um, so last video I did make a slight error um, right what I said when you know I said oh, I'm confident about that I, you know I made one mistake um, I said um, deceleration creates a blue arrow so we're back to this thing this is the the essence of the universe and deceleration is just the opposite the, the red arrow is going to come in through the side here hit the forward arrow knock the forward arrow going that way and it'll be releasing a red arrow so the electrons only reflect essentially uh, deflect create a 90 degree angle on red arrows and the blue arrows that hit a blue will always just ooh, pen ugh. come on pen okay yeah, the blue ones just do this thing. They just do the reflecting off the arrows of the electron. So the blues always just come straight back. No change in direction. The reds change direction. And essentially deceleration is just acceleration in a different in, in, the, in a direction opposite your primary velocity. Now, this might be really relevant to the two-slit and the entire subject of quantum mechanics and the fact that there appears to be some um, random choice in terms of where something ends up going. Okay, so the idea would be, um, I'll try to represent it, I guess, with um, maybe just dots of force or something. But you could imagine that if I had something that was had two two elements to its 
to, so so let's just imagine that these electrons is just full of a million of these little quanta. And let's just say I had six extra going this way more than we're going this way. So there's six extra. And there's four extra going this way instead of this way. Now the field is going to keep hitting it with the reflecting arrows from the blue ones and also the red ones. So the red ones are going to keep trying to knock off any extra because they're going to see the they're going to probabilistically affect the imbalanced ones more than the unimbalanced ones. Now let's say that you're you have a velocity so you have five extra going this way it kind of means you have five if, if they're ex truly extra not just five more than the ones going backward but you have five more than a neutral state so so let's just say if the if the electron was perfectly stationary you know, maybe there's a better way to say it it would have ten going in all directions so it would have ten going this way ten going that way 10 going up, 10 going down, 10 going forward, 10 going back. So then I can just add to that. And so what I'm saying it has, say it has 15 going forward. Um, it has to subtract that extra 5 from left to right or up and down. But there's still going to be a balance, uh, imbalance, left and right and up and down. So what I'm trying to explain is that, let's just cut it to two dimensions. So there's forward and there's left, right. Forward, back, left, right. So we have five extra going forward. So we have five less side to side, which means maybe we could have two less on one side and three less on the other side. That means we have three on one side and two on the other side, which means there's a tendency to go in the three direction. But it's a weak tendency because it's only three. It's actually 5 minus balance. So the angle isn't going to be a four, isn't going to be between left and right. It's going to have 5 extra going forward. That means for every 5 steps it goes forward, it's only going to go one step to the right. Now let's say 2 just for the sake of argument. It's only going to take 2 steps to the right for every 5 forward and it's only going to take 1 step to the left. So you can kind of see that it's going to go, it's going to have a tendency to move more in this direction, but it's not going to be splitting the difference. It's going to be more forward. So this angle, if you get what I'm talking about here, this angle is the variable angle. Depending on the acceleration of the electron, that is how fast it's moving forward, will dictate how much of an angle it's going to move at how much it lost from its perpendiculars and potentially how imbalanced how much the imbalance in those perpendiculars will affect this angle so this angle can be variable but it's always going to be quantized it's always going to be some precise amount um, a quanta a plank amount of angle it's not an unlimited number of angles that are possible, it's a limited number of angles that are possible. Alright, so that could be really very relevant to the fact that the two-slit experiment creates a broad pattern is because it has to do with how fast the electrons are moving in proportion to how much side-to-side -side imbalance they have. So it's still a little bit of a complex equation. But I would argue the side-to-side -side imbalance is the thing getting affected by the slit width. <laughs> so it becomes um, interesting and relevant and pertinent. Okay, so anyway, so somebody on this website here posted... Uh, well, first one guy posted a link to this, um, this, in, this TED Talks, and I saw it. And I, yeah, I could only watch like 60% of it. Um, first, it, it, they always do this thing with the, the the face mic, and it seems like such a bad idea. Like somebody would have figured out by now that you can hear like when they get dry mouth, and it, oh, it's really. I, I, my, I know I have some problems. I have wet mouth. I mean, I you know so, you know I don't have perfect 
articulation anymore. Left over from the stroke, maybe. I don't know. Bad teeth. I don't know. It, regardless, I don't talk as good as I used to. <laughs> but so, so, I mean, I'm not trying to be critical of the way the guy talks. I'm just saying, but putting those face mics on is just such a bad idea. And I'm just amazed they haven't figured that out yet. That it's really irritating to hear every swallow and sound. I find it obnoxiously obnoxious. So anyway, and then this theory is just insane. Yes, it's this crazy multiverse bullshit. It's just horrible. But yeah, it's just this, you know, physicists are religious kooks all the way. I mean, it really has just become uh, a fairy tale all the way down. All right, so anyway. So this was a, a antinatalist question. So this is the one here. Imenum, if light interacts with the material of the slits in the double slit experiment, different materials would produce different patterns on the wall. See, the trick with that is is electrons are all the same. And no matter how dense the material is, the spacing of the electrons is always going to be the same. The electrons won't space differently. That's sort of a charge thing. And charge really doesn't have anything to do with the density of the material that's charged. So that's really not going to be a consequence. I mean, a narrow slit is a narrow slit. Now the trick is, what does seem to be true, is if you lengthen, that is thicken, the slit, you'll destroy more of the light getting through. So that there, it appears that you're, you're providing more opportunity for more electrons to exist in between the slits by having thicker slits. But that experiment hasn't really been done, but I'm saying it's intuitive. You can say that we kind of do know that if you make the slit material a foot deep and with that very small hole that a lot of electrons, I mean a lot of photons, won't make it to the other end. It will degrade the light. Um, <clears throat> but then it depends on the polish. If the surface is polished and very reflective then the light will be fine. So it gets a little bit tricky. Um, so anyway, but the point is, is the, it, this is about electrons. It's not really about the surfaces that they're interacting with it's just about the nature of electrons a spark is a spark it doesn't care how thick the material is the spark is going to be the spark and it's going to be based on how many electrons are piled up on the end of the material so it it just doesn't it doesn't in my opinion it doesn't matter the electrons are going to space the same whether the slits made out of a thin film of carbon or razor blades or you know, a quarter inch piece of plastic. Quarter inch piece of plastic might do the thickness thing again, so it might change it a little bit, but that change will be being caused by something different than a change in the electron pattern. It'll be a change in the density of the electrons because you have more surface area. You're creating a bigger plate, plate plane uh, for the electrons to be moving back and forth are lining up on and again it's more just about their alignment so my argument is is that the slit creates the, the when the slits are far apart okay uh, let's pretend this is far apart the electrons stay close to home but when the slits are close together the electrons migrate into the field these are trying to do the lightning thing. They're trying to do the spark thing. So they're they're being migrated by the force into the field. Probably from one side to the other. Obviously there's one side that's plus and one side that's minus. Uh, the minus side is the side that has more electrons. <laughs> right? So but anyway the point is is these electrons are moving into the field and they're filling it up as the slits get narrow and the further apart the slits are these electrons retract and so you lose all of this interaction that's why the pattern is so specific you go too wide there's no pattern just the right amount of wideness lots of room for electrons and they're trying to get across 
you go too narrow, no, electrons can't fit anymore, so you have to get pushed out. And you only have a few of them in there. So, I think that covers it. I think it does explain things like diffraction gratings. So what's happening with a diffraction grating is you have the lines so close together that electrons can't really fit in between them. So they're being pushed out to the peripheries. And that's why you're getting only a, you're only getting a couple of choices of direction because there's very few electrons and they're in very specific locations. So there's very few choices in terms of which way you're going to go, which way the electron will move. It's more about which way the electron goes. So obviously you can kind of imagine the electron that's outside of the slit is going to tend to go straight that way or that way. And it's not going to be anything in between. Very few choices. And they're all hitting essentially the same electron that's in the same position, which is the two little tiny slits, or here, let's say, and the electron's going to line up in the middle, forward, or back from the slit. All right, I think that's uh, enough of that. So I fixed that. I did that. I did that. And so, um, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's all I have. Um, I, I got to set up the laser, you know, to do the green laser for the good stuff. <laughs> and so, I uh, just not ready. I keep saying get it done, and I just don't get it done. Um, so I'll try to get that done tomorrow. And uh, I think I fixed where I wanted to fix. Um, yeah, so it is simple enough now. I, I mean, this is this. I'm pretty confident. This is all there is. There's just there's just the idea that blue hates blue and all the blue reflects so when two electrons come in contact with each other lots of blue is stuck between them it's going back and forth and it has nowhere to go and the only thing that has an outlet is the red to an electron and for the proton it's exactly the opposite the blues have an outlet and the reds just bounce off that's what makes them commons end up repulsive because they can't get rid of the blue in between them and that's the that's the game so I really should be able to um, do my computer model of it now because I think I've I've got it this is it's it's, it's I knew it was going to end up being simpler than I was thinking it was and it's really this it's really this simple um, the only interaction that matters is the opposite polarization right term that's the other one matters the pressure one holding things together but i'm just saying the one that's really important <laughs> you know, i don't know how to say that i mean obviously what's happening when these two when these arrows move back and forth is that these two things will move so they're going to get accelerated because of the these these things keep banging into it that means all the arrows going this way keep getting turned and the ones going that way so you end up with a an obvious disproportion of arrows going this way and that creates acceleration away from each other obviously um, so um, I hope that was okay as a clarification I mean I, I, um, I you know I will make a video with the light table and try to explain this very carefully but I think for the people who have been following along I think they under I think you can get what I'm saying here in terms of the general principle I think so okay so is that enough I think there was something else I wanted to deal with but I can't remember what it was um, but the diffraction grading thing is kind of uh, interesting you know the fact that you see, I've seen the double slit experiment done where they have, they'll put something else behind the, this double slit or the single slit, like another wire or something, and they're not lined up, and they'll s still blend into the pattern. They won't be creating a separate pattern, it'll blend into the pattern, and, um, 
that's not happening. I mean, with diffraction gratings, it seems obvious there's no room in between the two films for a very complex wave interference thing to propagate. It's obviously whatever's being, however the pattern's being created, it's being created really close <laughs> to the slits, right where they are. And this, that's uh, obviously is um, a bit of confirmation of the argument I'm making. I, oh, it's just terrible today. Nag, nag, nag. Anyway, till next time, I think that's enough.